Welcome to the talk, The Normal One by Professor Lau. Professor Lau will share about himself and the work ahead in the faculty. If you have any comments or questions for Professor Lau, please raise your hands on site or fire soon. Let's pass the time to Professor Lau. Professor Lau, please. Hi, you can all hear me. The microphone is working and uh, thank you all so very much for the invitation to speak at the Alumni Association annual meeting. Now, uh, I was asked by Matthew to come and share with you my story a few months ago. And when he asked me whether I was available and what I would like to talk about, uh, I asked him, what, ex what exactly do you expect me to talk about? And he said, it can be anything. It can be in English, it can be in Chinese, it can be uh, you know, in rheumatoid arthritis, or it can be just about yourself. And then I thought, this is the Alumni Association meeting, Alumni Association talk. The alumni is really basically part of the faculty family. So this is really very much like a meeting with members of the family, a meeting with the family. And I shouldn't really be talking about the latest of rheumatoid arthritis or systemic lupus erythematosus, etc. So I thought maybe, uh, although I think I know most of you, not every one of you know me very well. <laughs> so maybe I will use this time to really tell you a little bit about myself and my um, aspirations and also the challenges that I feel I will have over the next, uh, maybe just a few months or maybe a few years. And, and I would like to sort of uh, ask you for your support for the uh, development of the faculty. I will be very brief and uh, for any details of uh, what we intend to do, like how much do we need to repay this building and how much do we need to pay for the number three redevelopment, etc. I will be very happy to talk to you and if you are willing to write that check for us, okay? <laughs> right, uh, Matthew, I would like to thank you and I wish you well. He actually um, messaged me earlier on to say that uh, he has been classified as a close contact and I said I wish you stay well and he wrote back to say that I prefer to have caught the COVID now so that you know in a week's time he will be free, he will be unrestricted, he can go anywhere and, <laughs> and he wouldn't worry about the infection. So uh, I, and I asked him naturally if he does get the COVID come over to my office and sneeze at me so that I could actually <laughs> do the same too. Now, uh, for those of you who know me a little bit better, you will probably know that I am a football fan, and I am a fan of the Liverpool Football Club. And the reason why I picked this uh, title was really because of uh, you know, the current manager of uh, Liverpool Football Club, Johan Krop. And um, he actually was appointed uh, the manager of Liverpool a few years ago, and this was actually taken on the first day he was um, uh, interviewed by the press and uh, people were asking him, uh, those who were in football, people were asking him actually, asked him whether he would be able to revive Liverpool. Liverpool used to be a very good football team, but uh, in a lot, 20 odd years or 30 years ago, we started going downhill. And then we needed someone special to save the football club. And, uh, and uh, people likened him to uh, uh, Jose Mourinho, who was uh, then, a few years ago, uh, manager of Chelsea, who used to call himself the special one. So the press people asked him, are you the special one to you know, revive the fortune of Liverpool? And he said to the press that, I'm just the normal one. I'm not the special one, I'm the normal one. So in a way, I am a normal one myself. Uh, you have been too used to the special one, Gabriel Leung, for nine years now. And um, I think you have to, got to start getting used to me. Uh, I, I, I cannot actually um, not copy what um, one of my best friends actually said only a few weeks ago. When I and him, Philip Chen, Chan Lam Lok, 
uh, were both asked to uh, speak at the Hong Kong College of Emergency Medicine about the quality of a leader. So I actually dug up, you know, the, uh, the Wikipedia and books, etc., and then list out all the quality of the leaders and uh, spoke as if I was uh, giving a lecture. And then immediately after me, Philip went on stage and he showed a couple of slides that really impressed me a lot. And he was actually telling people the actual quality of a leader. Most of you will, will, will think that, okay, this is the leader. This is the guy who really fought and he could fight, etc. in the French Revolution. But in fact, he highlighted, you know, the fact that in the history of China, the people who were the true leaders, okay, were indeed like this guy from uh, the Three Kingdom, Lao Bei, okay, those of you who are from uh, Lao Bei. Lao Bei was never a good fighter. He uh, was not a good thinker either. He needed the, the help of, um, uh, uh, um, uh, what's his name again? Um, Ji uh, Lam, beg your pardon. He needed the, the help, of the, the, the brain of Ji Lam. He needed the arms and legs of Zheng Fei and, uh, and uh, Guan Yu, etc. So he was a leader, but he really couldn't fight. He was uh, not the, the, uh, the uh, leader that you thought uh, Napoleon was. And then, of course, the journey to the West. The leader, the real leader of this uh, foursome <laughs> was actually Tom Samjong. And Tom Samjong was the... Uh, guy who, who actually in the mumbled all the time, who knew nothing very much, and who relied on uh, the Monkey King and, uh, and his uh, other disciples to uh, fight for him, etc. But he was the leader, so he was uh, quite a normal one as well. So um, I decided that maybe I should tell you a little bit about my, myself, and this is... Uh, um, a long time ago, <laughs> to tell you about perhaps uh, my sort of a humble beginning. This was actually my, my picture, and uh, when I was, uh, I don't know how old I was, uh, maybe a year or so. Uh, obviously touched up, you can see my lips are very red, so uh, Photoshop was already available then. Okay. And uh, you might think that I was born perhaps in, in the year of the rat or in the year of the rooster, but in fact, the reason why I put this up was because I really, I was told by my grandmom, I had a very remarkable beginning. The night when my mom actually, you know, went into labor and then got sent to Gonghua Yuyun where I was born, the rats in my house actually got out of the, um, of the, um, of the um, hiding and uh, we actually used to rear chickens in our flat so that you know it's much cheaper if you rear your own chicken you can you know have your own chicken meat and the rat actually came out of the hiding to uh, grab the hens that we had in the flat and my grandmom was actually pulling the, the hen away from the rat and the, it was the first time that something like that had ever happened and that was when i was born so I, 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 I used to tell my uh, parents that maybe you should not have called me Chuck Singh, you should have called me, okay, Lou Xu, okay, <laughs> Rat and Lao. But anyway, so, um, so, so I was born in, in Sam Shui Bo um, and um, in Gongwa uh, Hospital. And I, was, um, I, I spent all my childhood actually in Sam Shui Bo and um, my father and my mother they uh, came from China after the uh, Second World War, the Cultural Revolution. Neither of them actually had any close friends or relatives in Hong Kong. They had just one or two distant relatives. My father came to Hong Kong on his own and uh, he told me, he was telling me all the time that in fact uh, all he had in his pocket was just a few Hong Kong dollars and he actually, I think, spent a few gaoji on taking the boat from the Star Ferry from Jim Sa Jui to Hong Kong to uh, look for his uh, distant uncle, who then introduced him to a 
factory where he took apprenticeship, where he worked very hard. Uh, he didn't even know about opening a bank account then. So all he did was then every month he saved up his salary, he bought a gold ring. So after a few years, after he has stacked up his few gold rings that he felt he had enough gold rings to open his own shop, his own factory, he did so. And then uh, he raised the whole family. And I came from a very big family, a family of 10 actually. And uh, I am the only boy of the family. Because perhaps I was the only boy in the family, I was kind of spoiled. <laughs> Why? Well, I didn't really have to worry too much about anything and uh, I was, I have to say, rather lost uh, when I was in school. This was uh, taken just before, I think, uh, we uh, graduated uh, Form 5, uh, finished our high school. And uh, I was rather lost. Um, my uh, examination results were never very good. I didn't think I was good enough or clever enough to do anything or to even consider entering university. But uh, shortly after this was taken, uh, my sister somehow got the permission from my parents. Okay, we were not very well off, but somehow she got permission from my parents to go and study in England. She went to Newcastle and subsequently to York to study mathematics, and she is, had since actually uh, worked as a teacher in mathematics, and she's just retired recently. And because my sister was able to go to England, I, 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 I sort of shouted, I actually asked or demanded my parents that I must also go, because uh, Hong Kong, we only had two universities. There was no way that I would uh, enter either of Hong Kong U or CUHK. So I, I demanded that I had, I, ha I had to go and join my sister, and. Um, because I was the only son in the family, of course, my parents would not allow me initially until perhaps a few weeks before I was due to go. Uh, they, they finally agreed to let me go. Um, and because we had no one to guide us, actually, where do you go to in England, etc. So uh, we basically, um, I basically applied to this uh, place called the Newcastle College of Arts and Technology. Newcastle upon Tyne is a northeast uh, city in England. Uh, it's rather cold. Um, that those days um, wasn't a very nice city. Now it's actually pretty uh, serene and pretty um, uh, um, uh, nice. And uh, I, I got admitted to the Newcastle College of Technology, and this is the only building, the only th only 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 building of the college. And uh, many of my classmates were people like those, him. Uh, those days we call them the punks, right? Okay. And they had their hair dyed bright red and bright green and bright yellow or bright whatever, and uh, uh, sticking up like that. And on the top floor of the Newcastle College was actually the common room. This is not the College of Arts and Technology common room, I just took it from somewhere else. And, uh, but it looked very much like the common room that I used to go to. And the most popular course of the college was actually called the common room engineering because no one went to the classes. Everyone just went to the common room, have a game of pool. And uh, students were allowed to smoke and of course to also drink as well. And it was uh, really not um, very inducive of uh, studying at all. But, but, but because my classmates were people like those. I'm not suggesting that they were not clever, but they actually chose a different lifestyle. And because they didn't actually you know, spend much time in the classroom and prefer going to the top floor of the building, I all of a sudden became the top student of the class. I was pretty lousy in Hong Kong, but I became the top student of the class. I knew all the questions that the lecturer you know, posed, and, and uh, all of a sudden I felt very confident. I also started working on studying very hard because, um, of course, I felt this pressure on me and my parents allowing me to leave home, uh, being the only son in the family. So I started working hard. So I, 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 I did very well in my A-levels. 
And, uh, but though I did very well and had very good results in my uh, classes, the first year I was in England, I was completely lost in terms of what I would like to do eventually, in terms of my career, in terms of my future study. I was like a headless chicken. Um, I was telling a lot of uh, students uh, last week that, in fact, uh, I had totally no idea what to apply for. Uh, at that time, uh, a lot of people talked about engineering, so I thought engineering would be a useful thing. Maybe I should study engineering. But I only knew civil engineering and electrical and electronic engineering. I think the electronic engineering was rather new then. I knew nothing else. I didn't honestly know what exactly civil engineers do. I, I, I <laughs> no idea. I just knew the word engineering. So I applied for a number of engineering programs, including civil and electrical and electronic, and one called production engineering. By these days, I still don't know exactly what <laughs> was, <laughs> was what, what was um, uh, production engineering. And then, so I had no guidance at all. And then a few months later, I set my A-levels. I um, got very good results. And then I realized that maybe I was uh, better than, the, you know, I could be better than just an engineer. And then I decided that I would not enter any of the universities, not accept any of the places over to me, that I would wait one more year. And this time, I would apply for medicine. But even then, I was a little lost. And I didn't actually know that if you wanted to do medicine, you must put medicine first on every of your application. I thought maybe I should try dentistry as well. If I didn't get into medicine, I got this fallback plan. Or maybe I can try um, pharmacy as well. So I had five choices. I put down medicine, dentistry, and pharmacy. and. Um, within among five different universities. And of course, I didn't get any offers from any of the medical schools that I applied to. Uh, I know that I have told this story to some students last week. I promise that I will not tell this story again. I initially planned to leave, keep this for my sort of a retirement talk, but now I have brought it forward. Because last week, uh, during the orientation day, I was uh, asked to talk to the students tell them a little bit about myself and to try to inspire them. I have to say that uh, I, I, I mistook, I mistook um, the, um, the, the, the day of the orientation of, for our MBBS students. I only remember that I was supposed to speak 10 minutes before the orientation program started. So without much preparation, I told them this story. So I, I hope you don't mind me sort of, uh, repeating this again, and if you have heard this, I am sorry. But, so I tried to apply for different medical related programs. And one morning in April, I was actually asked by the University of Dundee to uh, go up there for an interview. It was a rather cold uh, April, being a not very well-off student, I, I couldn't afford to go up there the night before uh, to stay in the hotel to get ready. I couldn't even afford a bed and breakfast. So I took an overnight train uh, from Newcastle. I was in Newcastle because, of course, I studied there. And, um, <clears throat> and um, I remember distinctly arriving Dundee around 6 or 7 o'clock. Uh, exactly, I don't remember but it was very cold. But I was still very happy because I was invited for an interview. And then there were quite a few of us, uh, young men and women, okay? And then uh, the admissions officer came over, Dr. Thompson, I remember him very distinctly in uh, some nice uh, jacket, 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 and a mustache. He's called Dr. Thompson. And he started taking names of people, you know, who have uh, arrived at the Dundee railway station. And uh, he, he shouted for a number of names, etc. And then I 
didn't actually hear my name. So towards the end, I raised my hand and I, and I spoke to Dr. Thompson and I said, Sir, I am here. I'm Chuck Lau. Uh, people in England or Scotland called me Chuck. Because uh, since I went over to, 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 to study, I all of a sudden discovered my identity. I have an identity crisis. So, um, so uh, I started using my Chinese name. Okay, so I said I'm Chuck Lau, and uh, I have been here for a while. And Dr. Thompson checked his name list and couldn't find my name. And then later on, he found out that in fact the uh, office made a mistake. I shouldn't have been at the interview. I wasn't even considered. But somehow someone called me up to Dundee to attend this interview. Uh, Dr. Thompson being a very nice doctor, he looked at me. I looked obviously very sad and um, totally devastated and um, almost cried, to be honest. And, uh, and uh, Dr. Thompson seeing this rather sad looking poor Chinese boy, so he decided that he would uh, bring me with me, uh, bring me with him to visit the medical school. I didn't actually take part in the interview at all, but I managed to walk around and then saw uh, to see the uh, hospital, to see the clinics, the operating theater, etc. And um, I was with the rest of the group for the one whole day. And towards the end of it, I went back to the Dundee station. I, um, I, I, I felt obviously very, very sad. And uh, I lost my way. I should be taking a train back, right back down from Dundee to Newcastle. I somehow I actually took the train to Glasgow instead and took a big detour from uh, the east of Scotland to the west of Scotland and then back to Newcastle again. So uh, I was uh, a bit like that for quite a few weeks. Uh, after that, I received no more phone calls. No more letters. There were no emails then, and uh, uh, except perhaps uh, later, I was uh, given an offer to study pharmacy in the London School of Pharmacy. Just as I was about to accept that offer, Dundee actually rang me up and said that, "Yes, we've got a place for you. Would you like to accept the offer?" So I was uh, really very, very happy over the top. So I, I, I accepted the offer right away and then I spent my next few years in Dundee. So again, uh, for those of you who might not know where Dundee is, Dundee is not a very popular place. The medical school is not like the uh, uh, Cambridge and Oxford. Okay. And uh, although it's, it's recently it was, uh, was voted the best medical school for medical students because, because it is um, uh, a very student-centered medical school. And uh, I, I uh, did quite well there. Um, I, I got a few merits and I didn't get the distinction, but I, I did quite well. In the next five years, I, it was uh, rather smooth and um, I had no problems. I enjoyed myself in the small city of Dundee. Uh, which was actually very famous for three J's then, the Duke, Jam, and Journalism. And D.C. Thompson, um, 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 uh, this is uh, very famous in Dundee. And um, until the very last day of my medical curriculum, uh, I've passed my medicine examination, I've passed my surgery, I passed my pediatrics, I passed my psychiatry, and then I had my obstetrics and gynecology examination. It was a long case. I thought I did okay. And um, I took the history, I knew exactly what was wrong with the, with the, with the uh, lady. Um, and uh, the lady actually had seven children, and that was okay. I actually asked the, the right obstetric history. And then during the viva, the, um, the, the professor asked me, how many fathers do these children have? 
or how many husbands does this lady have? And then I discovered that, in fact, unfortunately, I didn't ask that bit of the history. Uh, the seven children were from seven different fathers. Well, we can laugh at it, but this is a very important piece of information that we should have asked. And because of that, I failed my obstetrics and gynecology. And I was asked to go back the next day to, um, to uh, do the pass-fail viva. Again, I was uh, rather sad, but uh, I sort of uh, comforted myself that uh, I didn't actually fail. I was just, you know, not quite there yet to be successful. <laughs> okay, so it's just been postponed. So um, and, and I had no problem actually during the uh, distinction uh, during the pass fail viva, the next day, and I passed. And I think the sort of uh, this first bit of my sort of. Uh, Life history, I really could appreciate the importance of having guidance but before I entered, well, before I even went over to England or to Scotland, there was no one to guide me. When I was ready to apply for something in the university, I knew nothing. And uh, guidance is very important, and I, and, 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 and I do understand, therefore, that our students also need that. And, um, and I also perhaps learned that perhaps sometimes disappointments, okay, could be of course difficult to take, but um, you won't know what will happen eventually. If Dundee didn't make that mistake, I probably would not have uh, studied medicine at all. Uh, I just told myself that they made a mistake, they felt bad, and therefore when they eventually had a place, they offered me the place. If I had not gone through that moment of sadness and those few weeks that followed, then I wouldn't have uh, studied medicine. So I believe in a little bit of fate, and, um, and, uh, and uh, I did okay during my internship. And, uh, and, then, and then I went back to Dundee to, to, to undertake my uh, medicine training, okay? And uh, a lot of friends have asked me, why did I want to do rheumatology? And uh, I quote this from, uh, from a very famous um, rheumatologist from, uh, from, from the States, okay, Charles Brotz, who wrote in his uh, sort of a article on the brief history of rheumatology, suggesting that uh, rheumatic disease specialists okay, all had one thing in common, and that they were extremely nice, considerate, and caring people. The genetics of rheumatology are strong, and the field continues. And his wife concurred with him. Now, I must say, I didn't do rheumatology because I thought I was nice and uh, considerate or caring. In fact, to be honest, I wasn't so caring for my patients um, when I first came across rheumatic disease patients. Those days, um, there was nothing very much that we could offer our patients with rheumatoid arthritis or any other rheumatic diseases for that purpose. All of the patients who came complained of a lot of pain in the joints, and you could see the joints being in, uh, deformed, very sore, and they couldn't even walk, etc. And uh, the first rheumatology clinic that I went to, I told myself that I know this trick. It's quite easy. I was doing the rotation. It was a three-month rotation. I couldn't offer the patient anything, so they had pain. So I would change the uh, painkiller from one NSAID to another one, and I would ask the patient to come back in three months' time. Of course, by then I would have gone. I would have rotated to another subspecialty for training. I wouldn't have to worry about you know, managing this patient. So I was wrong. And, um, but I soon realized that I was very wrong. Because after all, I was indeed quite nice and I was quite considerate and I did care for my patients. And then after a few clinics, I realized that in fact, if I cared about the patient, if I spent time with the patient and um, 
they appreciated it. Uh, I mean, after a few clinics, some of the patients actually went back to talk to my consultants. They say that, ah, this young Chinese doctor was quite nice and quite pleasant. And, um, and, and although I had nothing to offer them to, for the pain treatment, etc., they really felt better after seeing me. So I, I started to like self rheumatology, but I was still wanting to do something else. There was, there was no development in rheumatology then. I wanted to be a hematologist to start with. I also wanted to be a cardiologist, particularly, I think those days we started having a lot of drugs for cardiac dysrhythmia, heart failure, etc. And cardiologists also started putting wires and stuff into patients' heart. And I thought, yeah, it was quite good. You know, I wanted to be an engineer. So uh, why not? And uh, after I completed my MLCP and uh, my so-called basic physician training, I started thinking about what to do. I was applying for different um, uh, 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 sort of specialty training uh, programs. Oops. And then this was actually taken. <laughs> this was actually taken. Uh, so can I do this? Yes. Along the uh, corridor in this hospital, Nine Wells Hospital and Medical School. Outside this ward, ward five and six, I actually asked my. Uh, friend who is still working there to take this picture for me. And I was walking with my, um, with my uh, then boss um, and uh, Professor Jill Belge. And uh, she was uh, telling me that she managed to find a small sum of research, uh, a small research grant to study the use of fish oil in rheumatoid arthritis. And she said, why don't you, you know, take a few years off and do a research um, a project in rheumatoid arthritis. So I thought, I have nothing to lose, and someone just offered me a job, why not? So I would just do rheumatology, and gave up hematology, gave up cardiology completely, just uh, like that. Of course, then, um, with rheumatology being a rather small subspecialty, it's easier to get to know each other, and I managed to do quite well um, in um, in this subspecialty. And uh, through this, I think I learned this word, serendipity, really. Rheumatology was something that I stumbled across. I had not thought about it, not considered it at all. I, in fact, at one stage felt it was a not worthy subspecialty to to, to specialize in, but subsequently it's given me a lot of wonderful years. As I said, being a young subspecialty, being a sort of, um, not with not many people in the field, I got the chance to really shine in the quotations as such. And, um, and uh, after a few years of the research fellowship, I came back to Hong Kong. And even that was uh, not planned. After my three years of um, uh, research fellowship, I was writing up my MD thesis. Although I did rheumatoid arthritis in the, uh, in the project, I actually did a, a, a thesis on Reynolds phenomenon and uh, systemic sclerosis. I started writing up my MD thesis. I was rising through the ranks in rheumatology. I was getting known uh, amongst the, the younger rheumatologists in the field. And uh, I wanted to stay in England and uh, not to come back to Hong Kong at all. And again, I was writing um, letters, applications, okay, to various um, universities for a senior registrar position. And then again, Professor Joe Belch came to me and asked me what I wanted to do. I said I wanted to you know, go to London or go to Manchester to do rheumatology. Could you be my referee? And then the Jill said to me, why don't you go back to Hong Kong? I was in Hong Kong a few months ago, and uh, colleagues will know that Hong Kong and Scotland, particularly Glasgow, we had a very close link those days. Many of our um, uh, 
uh, senior physicians used to train in Glasgow. And Jill actually came from Glasgow to Dundee. And then she said, I was back in Hong Kong a few, few months ago. I, I had fallen sick. And uh, um, uh, my boss, who was Charles Forbes, uh, asked me to go and see Professor Rosie Young. Why don't you, okay, why don't I write to Professor Young about you know, the possibility of going back to Hong Kong? And it was so happened that at that time, my predecessor, Dr. K.L. Wong, had decided to leave the university or UMU, University Medical Unit Rheumatology, him being the only academic rheumatologist. And there were only two in Hong Kong then anyway, one in Hong Kong U and one in CUHK. And even if I wanted to come back, if he was not going to move to the private sector, if I did not run into Professor Jill Belch, and if Professor Jill Belch did not run into Professor Rosie Young, I wouldn't have got the job. So uh, because uh, KL was leaving and there was this position um, you know, available, Professor T.K. Chan was actually very kind, he invited me to come back to Hong Kong, speak to a few people, not even a formal interview, and just offered me the job, and that was it. And so I was uh, back in Hong Kong in 1992 and, uh, and until the year 2007. Some of you might remember that I was away between 2007 and 2010. The reason being in 2006, my alma mater, uh, um, also my old boss, uh, Professor Jill Belch, she wrote to me and asked me if that was through email then, okay, and, and asked me if I would uh, go back to Dundee because uh, they were opening up a chair in rheumatology position. And being someone, I was considered myself loyal and patriotic and, uh, and uh, also knowing that Dundee gave me what I had, Jill Belch gave me what I had. So when she asked me to go back, I felt I had to say yes. So I went back to Dundee in um, 2007. That was a time when, in fact, my two, our children uh, were in the sort of a teens and they were growing happily. And I really cherished those few years in Dundee, um, uh, being able to spend time with my wife and my children. But then I discovered that I probably belonged to the University of Hong Kong. I didn't actually find working in Dundee, all that enjoyable. Despite the fact that the pace was much slower, Hong Kong was much faster, of course. And then I started missing Hong Kong. And I realized that maybe Hong Kong U is where I want to work. And then uh, I think in 2008, 2009, uh, Professor Sam Ping Lee, the uh, then dean, uh, invited me to come back to talk to him and then, um, um, and then um, suggested that maybe I could come back to Hong Kong. And uh, so two and a half years later, I was back and I've been back here since. And um, over the last 12 years, I have uh, really uh, experienced a lot working in the faculty uh, and I thank great Gabriel for offering me to work with him as an associate dean in teaching and learning between 2013 and 2018. And I've learned quite a bit from um, him and from the uh, rest of the deanery about the work of the faculty. So when I was uh, asked to consider taking up the deanship during the interim period, this is still interim, okay. <laughs> There is going to be a global search, and as I said, I might not be around <laughs> in a few months' time. But uh, when, when the president asked me to consider taking up the deanship during the interim period, I almost did not need any second thoughts at all. I said yes right away. And uh, over the last uh, few months, I discovered that I was quite wrong. I thought I knew the faculty quite well. Uh, having been the associate dean and then having chaired the Department of Medicine. But then little did I know that in fact we uh, have a lot of challenges ahead of us. Okay, I better speed up a little bit. So uh, challenges, a lot. When I could, um, um, as I said, I'm not going to go into detail in, in 
the, these challenges or the work of the faculty. But there are a lot of things that we need to do to improve, okay, uh, from the uh, perspective of our students, of the curriculum, of our staff, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I think this being a family talk, I would have to say that this year we have been hit by a big disappointment in terms of um, admissions of medical students to our MBBS program. Uh, there are many reasons, of course. This year we had um, more MBBS and MBCHB places in Hong Kong. Um, the number of students to be admitted had gone up from 265 to 295 per school. 10 years ago, or 12 years ago, 10 years ago, back about then, it was just 210. So of course, um, there were more places and um, uh, we therefore expected perhaps the uh, students who would be applying to us, the number will go down. And of course, with the, uh, um, the uh, MRO, uh, uh, Medical Registration Ordinance, uh, being redrafted, uh, we now have many more medical schools that our Hong Kong children can go and then eventually come back to Hong Kong to practice. So unlike the last 10, 12 years, when we only had to compete with CUHK, we are now competing with CUHK plus another 100 medical schools. So students had a lot more choices of medical schools. Students also had choices of curriculum as well. I, we all know in 2012, the uh, Hong Kong government suggested that, or uh, well, changed the, reformed the secondary high school education and university education for the uh, children of Hong Kong. And uh, so that everyone would spend four years in university and for medicine students, six years, etc. So uh, six years seems a long time. And I understand that some curriculum you can elect, okay, for second year entry and finish and complete your medical study within five years instead of six. So it's very attractive to our younger people. So we were competing and there were all these challenges for, you know, uh, students to join us. And then of course, uh, uh, medicine is growing and, um, and they are expected to be learning more. They are expected to be tested again and again and again. And uh, the fact that, you know, whenever you set the text, a test, of course, there is this chance that you will fail really deterred some and many, I should say, of the, uh, of the uh, potential students uh, joining us. So that's the main challenge with our students. And I believe that this is a big wake up call for us, okay? And uh, a lot of things that we cannot do, say number of places we cannot do much about it. Uh, uh, the 101 other medical schools that we will have to compete with. There's nothing much that we can do. But the curriculum, perhaps we can do something about it. And um, we all remember, um, so 12 years ago, we started the six year curriculum. A few years later in 2016, we, tur we turned the six year curriculum into a five plus one year curriculum in which students were allowed, or still allowed, to you know, do something outside of medicine to enrich themselves during year three. And uh, since a few weeks ago, a lot of our friends and colleagues advised me that perhaps, uh, Bhagavan, perhaps um, we could take this enrichment year out so that we can be competitive we can also do a, you know, five instead of six years cur curriculum. But I would like to say that um, although this is rather young, we've only had our first batch of curriculum, uh, enrichment year curriculum students graduating 
the summer just passed. I believe this is something good for our students. I believe that students should be afforded and allowed the time as a university student and not to be but in Chinese to allow them to leave medical school one year earlier. And, and besides, of course, the enrichment year curriculum, I will just be very brief, does give a many different choices for our students to, as the word goes, enrich themselves. They can actually elect to try to understand medicine better by you know, entering a research program. They can uh, um, go to um, Africa, to um, different places in the world to carry out humanitarian work. They can perhaps study something else outside of medicine in, other uni or in Hong Kong U as well as in other universities. And many of our first batch of uh, curriculum year, uh, enrichment year curriculum students had come back with a double degree. In fact, 60 out of uh, the 235 students who graduated in July. So I, I believe this is something good for our students. And I believe that uh, it is something that we should keep and not to take out as some colleagues suggested to shorten our curriculum so that we can be competitive as such in attracting students to join us. But we must do something else, okay? Besides uh, maintaining the curriculum, the enrichment year, we must do something else to make our curriculum student-centered. We must listen to our students. We must not forever increase the amount of work that we expect them to do. We must not forever increase the amount of knowledge that we expect of them. They only have so many, so, so many years. And um, so I thank Guberto for leading our next curriculum reform, and that is to, and, and others, of course, uh, uh, also in the audience, to, to, to look at how we can decongest the curriculum while at the same time making sure that students learn what they're supposed to learn and be competent enough to leave the medical school six years from now. So I won't go into detail. We can always have another uh, time to uh, perhaps discuss this. And, uh, and then, of course, the other challenge is our staff. And um, over the next few years, what, what we're going to do? We face a lot of problems with uh, recruiting staff. In fact, the whole of Hong Kong is facing a lot of problems recruiting people. Uh, the hospital authority you know, has difficulty hiring people. And we are even worse because we are not as competitive as many of our competitors. Hospital authority, they are offering a higher salary, more or less of a housing or whatever other allowances. They will almost automatically become an associate consultant five years after, well, latest five years after they have got the specialty you know, registration. Whereas with the University of Hong Kong, our pay is slightly lower. The various allowances are not as competitive. And colleagues are actually uh, faced with a lot of um, increasing expectations, uh, having to publish in high-impact journals, being cited thousands of times, and also at the same time being very good as a clinician and as a teacher, etc. So be, besides being student-centered, I believe that we must also try our very best to be staff-centered and as centered as possible. And we should lend them support. Support should be from all different directions. Not just giving them the money to hire a research assistant or to give them a big equipment to do whatever, so that, you know, um, uh, molecular testing, etc. But also support from all levels, recognizing their achievement, giving them the promotion that they are due. So uh, again, I thank the rest of the deanery for really working very hard over the last few weeks or months in looking at how we can convince the 
senior management team of the university, that we are slightly different and that we can be gauged or graded slightly differently and not just only on the research achievements, etc. So we will try to do that and that's the sort of support that we uh, need to give our colleagues. The next few slides I will be quite quick and then of course the other things that, that we really um, the other challenge that I'm facing with is, uh, you know, su support for our colleagues and students with uh, the right facilities. And uh, quite a number of pictures and uh, colleagues will know that last month we opened number 3000 Road, which is now uh, the home for the School of Nursing and School of Chinese Medicine. And uh, these are all the sort of facilities that we have, the simulation laboratory, uh, the uh, Chinese medicine clinic, ex and uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And for our sort of uh, various undergraduate programs, we're investing into um, technology to aid the teaching, uh, to aid the learning. Okay, S through simulation training. I won't go into detail. Through augmented reality, through virtual reality training, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All these actually require a lot of um, resources. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, you just heard from Matthew earlier on about the redevelopment program that, uh, oh, back of all before that. And then we are also planning to um, uh, 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 elevate two other blocks actually at the top end of uh, Southern Road, the, um, the Student Amenity Center. Phase one is actually for our, uh, uh, our medical students, okay, which hopefully will be uh, available by the year 2024. And phase two, hopefully target completion by the year 2027. When these two actually are built, we hope that we will have more, of course, quarters for our students, more commons for our students, and within the two buildings, there will also be some um, uh, 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 simulation tr training um, uh, uh, centers as, as well. And then, okay, coming back to uh, what uh, uh, Matthew reminded you all to do. And that is, uh, uh, in fact, later this week, I will have to uh, be speaking to the Honourable Legislative Councillor <laughs> about the uh, redevelopment of our Green Belt uh, next to Number 3000 Road or east of uh, Number 3000 Road. This is the uh, architect's or the artist's uh, impression of what it will look like. It, I'm sure it will look quite differently actually when we eventually <laughs> decided to build this. Uh, we hope that we will get the permission from the Town Planning Board and if we do, hopefully we will and can start constructions uh, from next year onwards. I won't bore you too much other than to say that once all of these are in place, then uh, we will have a very complete medical campus as such. With Queen Mary Hospital on the top, okay, where our patients are, and uh, also with number 3000 road, the phase one and two clinical training and amenity center, all the way down to the bottom or near the bottom of Southern Road, our, where we are now, as well as to the west, uh, to the east, the uh, Green Belt redevelopment. And when we have got all of these, hopefully we will be able to afford each of the different schools of the faculty a home. And by allowing these buildings to be interconnected, we hope to be able to offer everyone a home, but also at the same time be able to communicate with each other, to work with each other for the good and for the future development of the, uh, of the uh, faculty. I know I am rather long-winded. Give me five more minutes, okay? I will finish. Because I have to uh, touch on my uh, only hobby, and that is uh, to run. And I will tell you one or two stories about um, you know, my running hobby. Uh, these were taken many years ago. You can see that I was younger and I was uh, slightly more muscular then. Now the distribution of the muscle or the fat has actually become uh, uh, 
<laughs> slightly different. I actually did not start running until so I was um, middle-aged. <laughs> I wouldn't tell you when. But I always thought I was very fit. And uh, when I was in school, I, I used to uh, you know, win the medals in the school um, athletic days. And uh, when I was a young uh, lecturer or senior lecturer, I used to join the uh, cluster basketball team. And we also won a uh, three-a-side um, uh, uh, championship um, when I was younger. So I thought I was uh, very fit. And then when someone mentioned to me, perhaps, uh, why not you know, try this marathon? And I thought, why not? I was quite fit then. I was uh, playing basketball three or four times a week, and I didn't feel uncomfortable at all. And I used to think that running a marathon, which was uh, 42.195 kilometers long, was like doing a 6K run seven times. I was very comfortable doing a 6K run, no problem. I was quite fast, I, I thought. And, um, and, and I thought, yes, I will just do it. Having trained you know, to run a few 6Ks, and then, the, of course, the very first time that I attempted the marathon running, I was completely, completely defeated. And um, uh, I beg your pardon, Thai, uh, you might not understand this, but uh, inside my head and my heart, when I found that I was unable to complete my first marathon, it was like my runner friends used to tell me, Sang Yi Sat Bai. Okay, I was completely defeated. It was so bad. And then I realized that, of course, uh, if ever we want to do something, preparation is important. Understand what you are facing is important. And since then, I've fallen in love with um, marathon running, and I've done quite a few in Hong Kong, and uh, I started you know, wearing the university shirt, uh, started cutting out the uh, sleeves as well, <laughs> and, um, and uh, occasionally I, I actually finished uh, quite relaxed too, I was uh, doing all right. And it also took me to different places, this is Macau, uh, Edinburgh, Loch Ness, um, Gold Coast in Australia, and I've been also to Amsterdam and other places, uh, Osaka, Tokyo, etc. It really taken me to many different places. But really, the one marathon that I always wanted to complete, and complete as many, is the Hong Kong Marathon. I know it's completely boring. You have to run you know, along the highway all the way to Ting Ma Bridge and then back. No, no one to cheer at you at all during the whole race. But for some reason, I, I kept doing this. And um, Hong Kong really is my home. So, and I said to myself that I must at least complete. This was the second target. Initially, I wanted to complete at least 100 marathons. And uh, I realized that that was impossible. I'm not a very talented runner, I have to say. Okay, I needed to train. So I said I would do 50. But even with 50, I know now that it's not possible. With the job that I'm in, uh, uh, I have no time to train. And also, some of you might know that, in fact, I have fallen sick a few times in the last couple of years as well, primarily because of my running. I had heart problem uh, because of the stress on my heart during the long distance training. And, um, and uh, so I don't think I can complete 50 now. I have done 32, but Something that I've learned in running, and that is, although of course it be, it's nice to cross the you know, finish like this, I discovered that in fact, there's something else that I could do while running. Instead of doing the races myself, I a few years ago started really uh, volunteering myself as the so-called support um, sweeper, sweeper of, the, of races. All right, we actually have, um, I belong to a running club we call the Club Balance. And we actually had uh, this race that um, uh, is held until two years ago on the 1st of October when we will run from Star Ferry all the way up to the peak, a 10K route, but all the way up. So the so-called Victoria to peak uh, 
um, uh, challenge. So it's a very challenging course, of course. And um, so I started actually taking up uh, being a volunteer. And then I started realizing that, in fact, crossing the line like this is good, but really being able to support others to cross the line is just as good. This is, a, uh, he doesn't mind uh, me taking a photo with him. This is in uh, Central, near, um, near City Hall. And this is him, actually, you know. I took him all the way uh, from City Hall to uh, the peak. And then I started liking this. And uh, the next year, I, I actually uh, helped this other lady do this. And, um, and this other lady. I'm sorry that I had to block out their faces because I did not ask them for permission uh, uh, to show the picture. And you can see they were struggling a bit. But both of them actually managed. And this other lady, one year later, you can see that she slimmed down a lot. She actually just did the race and completed it herself. And uh, so being able to uh, help others, I think, is important. So I know that I have um, overrun my time. I beg your pardon. But I would like to finish off by saying that um, it's been a long time uh, since I started medicine or before I started medicine. I have um, come a long way. I've been to England, Scotland, back to Hong Kong, back to Scotland and back to Hong Kong again. Uh, I have found, you know, life is a long distance course and uh, I have never been very special. I was not good in my school results. I was not good enough to be considered for medicine, but somehow I managed to get into it. I, um, this is another hobby of mine, and that is uh, I like basketball as well. You see, I don't always put the ball in the basket. <laughs> but it's quite nice, actually, and quite enjoyable to be able to do this pass and have someone else score the basket instead. And with this, I would like to thank you for uh, you know attending my one hour and a bit talk. So this is Liverpool Football Club. You never walk alone. And uh, same with uh, Hong Kong New Medicine. I will need all the support that you can offer me and you want to offer me to help to continue to ensure Hong Kong New Medicine do well. Thank you very much.